Okay, so you've probably heard this argument before. You probably have even seen videos like this one before. You might have even clicked on this video looking for another one. I really don't need to make an introduction for this. You saw the title, you know exactly why you're here. But today, we settle this debate, once and for all. I'm going to go over everything each version of Spider-Man has to offer over the others, and we'll see which one is truly superior. For the sake of clarity and brevity, I will call the Sam Raimi, Tobey Maguire trilogy, Spider-Man 1, 1, 2, 1, and 3, 1 respectively. Mark Weave and Andrew Garfield's versions will be called Spider-Man 1, 2, and 2, 2. The Marvel Cinematic Universe Spider-Man movies will have Captain America Civil War as Spider-Man 1, 3, Homecoming as 2, 3, and Avengers Infinity War as 3, 2, with the sequels of Infinity War and Homecoming as 3.5, 2, and 4, 1, respectively. Makes sense, right? Good. Let's start off with Spider-Man 1-1. This is the kickoff to the trilogy that many people, especially older fans, call the best because MY NOSTALGIA! <laughs> and after having recently rewatched the film for the purpose of this video, I'm gonna have to say it. It's not that good. I have lots of nostalgia for Spider-Man 1-1. It was one of the first movies I ever watched in my life. It quite literally set the standard of what I was supposed to be looking for in a piece of entertainment. But after taking my nostalgia goggles off and comparing it to my current standards of entertainment for films, it's not that good. I can already hear the angry clicks of the keyboard clacking away about how wrong I am, and to that I say, shut up stupid boomer, just let me get to the pros before I get to the cons. Now the first thing 1-1 does best is come first which may not seem like that much of an achievement for some, but there were other pitches for Spider-Man movies that were trying to get made, most notably was an R-rated one directed by James Cameron. Sam Raimi got the long end of the stick when he ended up getting his movie made, instead of anybody else's. A good bunch of the characters were perfectly cast, most of them looking and acting exactly how they do in the comics, particularly J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. Originally, the late great co-creator of Spider-Man, Stan Lee wanted the role, as the character was based on himself, but after seeing JKS as JJJ, the man happily stepped down. Another thing worth pointing out is the suit. This was the first time a superhero movie adapted a suit from the comics, took liberties with it, and made it look good. We take it for granted now because there are so many superhero movies and so many cool super suits, but this was the first time the trifecta was completed. Originally, superhero movies only did two out of the three. Take a look at Superman 78 and Batman 89. Comic book accurate, no liberties taken with the costumes, and they look good. Now look at X-Men 2000. They took liberties with the suits, they're not comic book accurate, but they do look good. Now look at Batman and Robin in Batman Forever. They're somewhat accurate, with some liberties taken, but they don't look good. Now that I'm finished with the pros, it's time to move on to the cons. I kind of don't want to do this, because I'll get all the dislikes and negative comments from the old farts who just can't let things go. But I'm still gonna have to rip off these band-aids regardless. Let's start with something easy to accept and move on to the harder bits as we go along. The CGI and effects in Spider-Man 1-1, while beautiful for the era, have not aged well. There are more than a few parts during this movie where I said ooh or yikes because I found it crazy to think this was the best CGI of the time. Actually, to be honest, the movie probably didn't have the best effects. Just look at Avatar, which was only made seven years after. Spider-Man 1-1 doesn't have a candle to it. Maybe to make up for not being able to make his Spider-Man movie, James Cameron decided to dab on Raimi by making a far superior film. This next problem is going to be a bit more controversial. 1-1 one, one, along with 2-1 and 3-1 get very cheesy at moments. Everyone makes fun of 3-1 for its cheese, but all three Sam Raimi movies are just as cheesy. Just take the entire parade scene. It's all straight out of a cartoon. I'm gonna dub over it because uh, I don't want YouTube's algorithm to screw me over. All right, all right. So it starts out. It starts out with Green Goblin flying in. Everybody's like, "Oh, what's that? Wow!" In a very realistic reaction that I totally believe. Then it's all, 
and then Peter's all like, I am fearless, and then there's Mary Jane, she falls, and she's like, oh no, help me, I'm a weak independent woman who is very much in need of a man, and then Peter Parker transforms into Spider-Man and swings into action, Green, Green Goblin throws a bomb in with one flash, the old white men turn completely into skeletons. Then Green Gobby concusses his own son. He, then he looks like he's going to do some strange things to Mary Jane that she will only mention after 15 years. Then there's a girl saying, it's Spider-Man! And our hero swings into action and they fight. And there's this one part where Gob kicks Spider-Man like 30 feet. And there's more... Uh, strange things happening and then the hero beats the villain and then the guy goes we'll meet again spider-man while flying off into the distance the crowd cheers as their beloved hero kidnaps a random teenage girl and takes her who knows where to do who knows what like i said so much cheese okay so here's another problem one that's a little more serious spider-man 1-1's got a lot of culturally insensitive content in it some of the most iconic scenes in the movies has at least one thing that, about it that I found triggering. Case in point, the parade scene that I was just talking about. My eagle-eyed viewers may have already spotted them. The first point worth mentioning is the dress Mary Jane decides to wear. Excuse me, what? What right does this white woman have to be wearing a Chinese kimono? This is the visual epitome of cultural appropriation. My culture is not your Chinatown parade dress, Miss Watson. Next is the fact that at no point in this scene, no, this film, no, this franchise is Mary Jane strong nor independent. She's literally always screaming for some man to sweep in and save the day da, 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 da. how about you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and save your own darn day miss watson so this next problem is a little bit more major and you may have and you may not like me for this one so you know how people say toby is the best peter parker andrew is the best spider-man tom is the best both well i have no idea what they're talking about as far as toby's peter he sounds like a total wimp, which is fine before he gets bit by the spider, but he maintains these wimpy mannerisms throughout the entire film, and by extension, the franchise. You have a knack for getting in trouble. You have a knack for saving my life. Make sure you stay in the kitchen like a good woman, okay? Let me kiss you because I'm a dumb, vapid, one-dimensional character who exists only to be the main character's love interest. <laughs> This scene shows off two things, Maguire's wimpy Spider-Man voice and more culturally insensitive subtext that was subtly added into the script. There are several other scenes like this, including the wrestling scene. That's a cute outfit, did your husband get it for you? Wow, Sam Raimi. I guess 2002 was a different time. Then there's the scene where Spider-Man beats up a black criminal. I can't show it on screen because YouTube will screw me over. But the raw wall crawler is being surprisingly brutal on him. We see punches with immense power that I haven't seen any time earlier in the film. Between punches and kicks, the friendly neighborhood web slinger yells things like, STOP RESISTING! I can't help but feel bad for the guy who only stole a pack of gum. Spider-Man finishes the bruised, mangled, long unconscious guy by hanging him by the neck on a street light post. This sounds like racism. This looks like racism. Like I said, I can't show you this clip because YouTube will surely take down this video. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find this scene at all. It was removed in DVD, Blu-ray, and digital re-releases of Spider-Man 1-1. It, along with other smaller shots, doesn't appear in TV reruns. Many owners of VHS copies have intentionally removed this scene from their tape. I only know about it because my cousins and I came across a VHS of the film when we broke into some old Trump supporters house and ransacked it in protest of the 2016 election results. Anyway, there's also one of the most iconic scenes in superhero film history, Uncle Ben's speech. When I first saw Spider-Man 1-1 in the theater, I remember turning to my mom and whispering, he's talking to me. I remember the burst of inspiration I felt when that man was outlining the meaning of p great power and great responsibility. 
I remember whispering the classic quote to myself while walking from the theater out to the car. I remember dramatically looking up into the densely overcast sky and putting a fist to my chest and promising Uncle Ben that I wouldn't let him down. Now, I wish I could take it all back. <sighs> I'll just show you the clip. You know, Peter, with great power comes great responsibility. Rudyard Kipling called it white man's burden. Myself, I call it as I see it. The responsibility of the master to discipline the servant. The negroes, the spicks, the chinks. It's our responsibility to civilize them. And if we can't, then they shall dangle from the elm tree. The day of the rope is near, Pete. We'll have every darky in this country dead or in chains in ten years, and may God have me shot in a carjacking this very night if I'm wrong. God bless the American Nazi party. There's also the death scene. He was white, Peter. All these years protesting the Civil Rights Act, and one of my own gets me. Was I wrong, boy? I think he was Italian, Uncle Ben. Oh, Peter. Thank you. Listen, I, I can't talk about this movie anymore. Moving on to Spider-Man 2-2. I mean, 2-1. Spider-Man 2-2 is not 2-1 is the best movie in the trilogy. It highlights all the best themes about Spider-Man as a whole. It shows Peter struggling to maintain his normal life and his superhero life, a villain with a personal connection to the hero, several spectacular shots showing small, subtle, symbolic details, the advancement of major character arcs, the creative, engaging, original, yet-to-be-topped fight scenes. It's all here. I mean, the other two movies do the exact same things, but Sam Raimi spills his passion all over this movie like a teenage boy whose parents aren't home yet. It does suffer from some of the same problems, however. The CGI is still pretty bad compared to stuff that would come out only a decade later, and there are still lots of politically incorrect messages, and Mary Jane is still weak and stupid. What are you still doing here, cracker? Go! Reverse racism. Nice. Is it just me, or is Mary Jane kind of a hoe? In 1-1, one, one, she kissed a random masked man whom she doesn't know while on her way to meet her boyfriend. In 2-1, she leaves a perfectly good guy, successful, lots of money, handsome, a gentleman, for one of her high school friends who was a proven jerk to her. She even talks crap about this dude to her boyfriend, excuse me, fiance. Nothing in this movie shows him as a bad guy. John Jameson does nothing wrong to Mary Jane, and she still leaves him for the repeated promise-breaking douchebag. Not only that, she does it on the wedding day, something John and MJ had undoubtedly been looking forward to, planning what to wear, and talking to each other for months. She tears down John's monumental metaphorical mural that he had been building during the entirety of his off-screen character arc. She treats John as a stepping stone, nay, an obstacle to get to Peter. <sighs> damn, damn, damn. This is way too similar to my own... Ne next m movie, please. <sighs> Spider-Man 3-1 is not as bad as everyone says. Everything everyone complains about the movie having is seen in, and praised in the other two movies. There are campy moments in all three movies. There are dark, hedgy, horror-esque sections in all three movies. There are attempts to fully develop every character in all three movies. So what's the issue? Well, it just doesn't do that something right, you know? The thing that isn't done right is the directing. Spider-Man 3-1 was not what Sam Raimi wanted it to be. It wasn't what anyone wanted it to be. Why is that? Well, there are a couple of different reasons. Let's break it down. Reason number one is corporate meddling. In Spider-Man 3-1 was going to have Sandman and Harry Osborn as the Green Goblin with the brief appearance of the Vulture to set up Spider-Man 4. Then Sony came along. Sony wanted to give the fans what they wanted so they could make more money. And the fans wanted Venom. As it turns out, Sam Raimi was not only a racist, but also a boomer who doesn't care about them newfangled whippersnapper characters like Venom. So Sam Raimi just shoehorned in 
venom and ripped Vulture out. Now, although he wasn't 100% happy with what he had to put in this movie, Sam Raimi still wanted to make Spider-Man 3-1 good and please the fans. People loved Venom, and there was a lot of pressure to pay respects to the whole black suit story arc correctly. Costume designers actually put together a black symbiote Spider-Man suit that looked exactly like the comics, but Sam Raimi literally said, uh, yeah, that's gay. Uh, yeah, it looks like something from a gay porno. Uh, not that I watch gay pornos, because that's not gay, and I hate gays. So instead of that, we got this uh, recolor of the original suit that we all know about now. Where am I? What is this? I feel a sudden urge to steal bikes, eat fried chicken, play basketball. Spider-Man 3-1 repeats the tradition of the previous two films in the franchise and gives all the villains a sympathetic backstory. Like I said, Sam Raimi didn't like what he had to do with this film, but he still did what he wanted to do with this film. Harry's transformation into the new Goblin was great. Retconning Sandman to be Uncle Ben's real killer was kinda weird and dumb, but still executed pretty well. Eddie Brock even had an interesting backstory. He's had just a crappy a life as Peter Parker without an Aunt May or an Uncle Ben to guide him. Add Venom, an alien entity that highlights all the aggressiveness and evil into a person, and you've got a completely understandable, well-rounded supervillain. Hey look man, I wanna kill the spotter. You wanna kill the spotter. We both can kill the spotter, together. What you say, nigga? Yes. You really thought you could get away with that, didn't you, Raimi? There's no doubt that the action scenes are on point. The CGI is actually good for once. There's the scene where he saves Gwen Stacy, who I guess is trying to compete with Mary Jane for the first place in the Scream A Lot and Be A Thought Championships. The birth of Sandman remains great, as do the scenes in which Peter gains and loses the black suit. The climax is amazing, especially given the fact that all three characters get closure at the end. So what was so bad about Spider-Man 3-1 again? Oh yeah, the cheese. We already addressed this, but there is another point I neglected to touch on. Spider-Man 3-1's dark and edgy moments were highlighted much more than the first two movies. Spider-Man 1-1's trailer promised a fun-filled superhero romp, and it delivered. Spider-Man 2-1 promised, promised the same thing and blended in an emotional story about a man's life crashing down on him, with lots of fun moments still sprinkled all around. Fans expected Spider-Man 3-1 to be a super dark and edgy story about a man whose life becomes a monster. Because, well, that's the area of comic books that the Venom art comes from. But Sam Raimi had different ideas. He just wanted to the pure goofy fun of 1-1 and the emotion of 2-1 and combine them into 3-1. But now, he had to add Venom into the equation. Now he had to add darker and more grim elements to the movie to appeal to fans and Sony. So he did, but he also kept the goofy nature of the other two movies as well. And what we got is what you see. Spider-Man 3-1 wasn't a bad film in my opinion. It's just a little misunderstood. It's got everything the two movies in the original. So Spider-Man's a Negro now? Next movie. Ugh, we don't have to talk about the Andrew Garfield series. Actually, wait. We do have to talk about the Andrew Garfield series. Without Spider-Man 1, 2, and 2, 2, there'd be no MCU Spider-Man, or a very different one than there is now. Spider-Man 1, 2, and 2, 2 will likely go down in superhero film history, or even film history in general. And you can't just remove parts of history just because you don't like them. You have to keep the bad parts to show how we got to the good parts, and learn to uh, avoid repeating the bad parts. So let's get into it. It's immediately clear from right off the bat that Spider-Man 1-2 is trying to distance itself from the original trilogy. The first noticeable thing is the suit. It decides to complete only two sides of the trifecta and we get this ugly, noisy, overly textured basketball looking thing that stupid middle school me liked. On top of that, the tone of Spider-Man 1-2 is very different from the original trilogy. 
The original trilogy was not afraid to be fantastical and cartoonish. This one is a little bit more grounded and gritty, clearly having some inspiration taken from the Dark Knight trilogy. You see, in order to distance itself from the Raimi trilogy, Sony decided to steal ideas from other superhero movies rather than from the comics. But bizarrely enough, Spider-Man 1-2 does have some elements that do come from the comics, namely the things that Sam Raimi neglected to add. The first and most obvious thing is the web shooters. The web shooters are significant because it's a clear and consistent way to highlight Peter's genius. Peter was definitely a genius before, but now we're shown this in a whole new way. Spider-Man is also much more of a jokester now. Previously, we'd seen the webhead make jokes, but they were honestly pretty lame, and the comedy came forth in other forms anyway. But another trade off to these comic book accuracies are more inaccuracies. The thing pretty much everybody has said and been saying since they walked out the theater is Peter Parker was too cool, and whatever, whenever he joked around his enemies, he came off as a petty jerk about it. Just watch here. Hey bro, just take the ball bro. What are you, slow? Or mentally challenged? We have specialists in this school for that bro. What's wrong bro? Too weak? I'd suggest eating more protein in your diet bro. Hey bro, are you abusing your white privilege bro? Not cool bro. You see I'm Spider-Man and I know what's cool and not cool bro. Ah! Did that hurt, bro? Good, because stupid people like you don't deserve to reproduce, bro. Jeez. The next major element that was taken from the comics was the villain with the personal connection of Peter. This villain was Kurt Connors, aka the Lizard. Oh no. Dr. Connors class. The problem is that the connection is there, but the audience doesn't feel it. I don't have quite enough reason to care about him being connected to Peter's father. I don't care about him getting his arm back. I don't care about his transformation into a giant lizard. They don't spend nearly enough time developing any of this, so now he just feels like a generic villain. It feels like the making of Spider-Man 1-2 had a checklist that all the staff members working on the movies had to follow behind the scenes. New suit, check. Web shooters, check. Dark and gritty like the Dark Knight, check. Jokey Spider-Man, eh, check. Villain with a connection check. Yep, the kids are gonna love this. The passion that Sam Raimi put into his movies isn't here. That was sort of intentional, yeah, but it should have felt like someone had passion put into this. I mean, you can tell that some people did care. For example, the fight between Lizard and Spider-Man were great. Andrew Garfield definitely cared a lot about Spider-Man and was clearly trying to do what he could with the script, but unfortunately, the script called for Spider-Man to become this unfamiliar mess. The romance between Peter and Gwen Stacy worked better than the original Peter and Mary Jane. They bounce off each other real nicely, and the fact that Gwen is much less of an annoying whore is a nice touch. Spider-Man 1-2 is like that high school group project with people you knew but weren't friends with. Some people did their best, some people did the absolute bare minimum. On top of that, there's this looming feeling that this movie was mandatory that never really goes away. So Spider-Man 1-2 was, yeah, a mess. But Spider-Man 2-2 was, was an even bigger mess. I remember the first time seeing it with a bunch of friends at my house. We built a fort downstairs, and we all brought snacks, and we all planned on having a good time. If only I could go back in time and tell the past version of me. If only he knew how bad things really are. We would have watched the movie Bernard bought, Interstellar, and not made fun of him for bringing a boring-ass adult movie. I still remember the first 10 minutes. It was actually great. It was so energetic. The web swinging was so cool. The colors were so bright. Spider-Man immediately goes into fighting crime and making jokes that are actually funny and didn't make him look like a jerk. The entire scene felt like a comic book or a cartoon come to life. I remember my friends and I cheering and shouting because this was Spider-Man. To us at that moment, we were looking at the most definitive Spider-Man that we had ever gotten. It breaks my heart that there is an alternate universe or even an alternate script in this universe where the rest of the movie matches the first 10 minutes. 
but unfortunately, Spider-Man 2-2 is yet another film in the franchise that's a victim of corporate meddling. This time, Sony actually literally had a list, a quota of things that they felt needed to be in the film to expand their amazing Spider-Man universe so that it could become some kind of competitor to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which was and still is booming in popularity. That's why there were three villains, with one not really making his real appearance till the very end, why there are so many loose plot threads and setups for things that didn't even exist yet. You've probably heard this one before. Spider-Man 2-2 was hardly even a movie, it felt like an advertisement for future movies. MCU movies are like that too, but at least there's some focus on making a movie. I debated about this with my friends at the sleepover while the credits were rolling. Bernard told me that Spider-Man 2-2 was no better or worse than the average MCU movie. My Asian friend Komori told him to shut up, you depressed loser nerd. Bernard retaliates by saying that the only reason we're all even here is that we're all depressed loser nerds. I tell him that I'm here because this is my house, you dip. He tells me that's not the point. He asks us, what's the difference between the average MCU post credit scene and the one we're watching, the Sinister Six one. Jason tells him that this one is bad and the MCU ones are good. Bernard is starting to get pissed and raises his voice, demanding that Jason explain his reasoning. My brother comes down from upstairs and tells us to shut our peanut head asses up and that a dude's trying to get some Z's. Bernard goes into a fit of rage and has, because he has anger issues or something and tries to smack my brother. My brother's 6'5 and is not hurt by the blow and he pushes Bernard back a little. Even still, no one hits my brother, so I punch the absolute crap out of Bernard. My friends and I end up jumping Bernard. After he falls unconscious, we duct tape him to the couch and draw 69 penises on his face with Sharpie. After that, we all get back into our forts and take turns playing Dragon Ball Z Budokai 3. In 2014, there were plans for an Amazing Spider-Man 3, or a Spider-Man 2 3, or 3 2, as well as a Sinister 6 movie, some kind of female-led Spider-Man film, and some other stuff. We know this because of the giant Sony Pictures hack back in 2014, which leaked an absolute host of emails and conversations between the affiliates at Sony's and other corporations. On top of that, Andrew Garfield was scheduled to appear at an event in Brazil following the 2014 World Cup, where a Spider-Man 3-2 would have been announced, but unfortunately, Garfield was too lazy and fat to show up. Sony took this personally and decided to fire Garfield from all Spider-Man projects. Between the hacks, Garfield's firing, and other factors such as Mark Weeb leaving Sony, the company decided to share the Spider-Man license with Marvel Studios, which brought forth the new Spider-Man trilogy. Spider-Man 1-3, Spider-Man 2-3, and Spider-Man 3-2. Spider-Man's new suit pays much closer attention to the original design of the comics. The moving eyes were a clever touch that added a new way to not only reference the source material, but also show how the webhead was feeling. Before, whenever an emotional scene was being portrayed on the screen, the story called for Peter to have his mask removed at some point, so the audience could really empathize with, with the protagonist. Now there's not as much need for the mask to come off anymore because we can identify what emotions are being conveyed at what times. You might still notice that they still do take off the mask because it, serve, it saves on the CGI and sometimes it just hits harder when we see a human face. The suit looks almost exactly like the classic design of the suit used in the comics of the 1960s when they were still being drawn by Steve Ditko. The main downside, in my opinion, is that this suit perpetuates the new stereotype where the modernization of a comic book super suit means the addition of all these unnecessary lines and strips and seams. Spider-Man 1-3 shows us a civil war within the Avengers and Spider-Man being caught in the middle of the fray. Tony Stark gives him an advanced new suit and offers him an opportunity to fight alongside him and meet new friends. It troubles him that he must fight other members of the Avengers, but I guess not enough for him to stop fighting. Have mercy. Please, we the good guys and shit. I don't give a fuck. Besides advancing the plot, the airport scene in Spider-Man 1-3's main purpose was to showcase what these new superheroes could do. Nobody except comic book super nerds and black people knew who Black Panther was. Some people were foolish enough to skip out on watching Ant-Man because it wasn't a crossover movie, on top of the fact that it was our first time seeing Ant-Man as Jai Ant-Man. 
Some people were confused and skeptical about the inclusion of Spider-Man and needed something both fresh and easily recognizable for the third incarnation of the character for them to be sold. Fortunately, Anthony and Gio Russo managed to have audiences sold on all three new characters. Let's skip to Spider-Man 3-2 for just a minute because like 1-3, Spider-Man only has a small role in a big crossover event. In said event, Tony Stark gives Peter yet another suit, which is marketed as the Iron Spider suit. The Iron Spider suit in the comics was also given to Peter Parker by Tony Stark. However, the suit in the movie is much different from the simple, sleek design of the original, and in my opinion, it sits on the fence that separates a cool high-tech aesthetic suit from an ugly, over-designed one, almost like the suit in 2-1. In Spider-Man 3-2, Peter Parker decides to take part in an infinity war between the Avengers and the powerful alien tyrant Thanos. He makes new friends along the way, like Doctor Strange and the Guardians of the Galaxy, Spider-Man is up against a threat no one, not even the past incarnations of himself, have seen before. There's really not much else to say. Oh, wait. I don't feel so good! That must have been what you wanted. In all seriousness, this scene is extremely well executed and blocked. Tom Holland did an amazing job here. His, apparently, he didn't know he was dying until the day he had to film it. His death was actually going to happen as quick and suddenly as everyone else's, but Tom decided to, to take a step further by improving and improvising a more dramatic scene that fits surprisingly well into the script, especially considering that he never even read it. It's a bit crazy that one of the biggest takeaways from Tom Holland's Spider-Man is now considered a stupid meme line. Now we move on to Spider-Man 2-3. In this film, Spider-Man struggles to live up to the names of his childhood heroes, who he met and fought with just a few months earlier. But he has to also balance his personal life with his superhero life, a common trait amongst all good Spider-Man stories. My thoughts on 2-3 exactly mirror the points mentioned in High Top Films' video essay, Spider-Man Homecoming is a Bad Spider-Man Movie. In every good Spider-Man story, there are hard choices for Peter to make. And along with these choices come consequences, because, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. In 2-3, Peter does have hard choices, but it feels like there are no consequences. Everything turns out pretty well for him. One thing I like and dislike at the same time is the fact that Tony Stark is a guardian angel for Peter. It creates an interesting dynamic that is sometimes kind of cute in a way. This ties into the coming of age aspect that comics and movies depicting a young Spider-Man has. During much of the movie, Peter is treated like a kid by Tony, then Spider-Man tries to do some bold adult stuff, then Spider-Man screws up, then the adult Iron Man comes in and fixes everything. Then Spider-Man learns to really do something himself and not screw it up, like an adult. The thing I don't like about this is that he learns everything the easy way, Spider-Man being an allegory for every normal person needs to learn things the hard way too because some teens make decisions that end up in other things than the parent just taking away the gifts that they gave their kid. Alright, give me your phone. Oh my god dad, I'm literally like nothing without my phone. Like oh my god, come on Peter, like literally come on Spider-Man. Okay. Now that we have every single movie laid out, which one is the best? They all have their positives and negatives, they're all comic book accurate in their own ways, and they all make their own changes that make themselves stand out. All three actors do a exceptional jobs with what they're given, but none of them have every quintessential element that Spider-Man is supposed to have. So which is the best? To me. The best Spider-Man is Spectacular Spider-Man, the animated show from the early 2000s. This is what got me to really care about this character and his world. This has the elements from all three franchises. It really is a love letter to the original comics, but it isn't afraid of making changes either. The design of the show is really something else that you have never seen before. It stands out. It's unique. 
Oh, wait, Gov's already made a video about that. Okay, um, to me, Spider-Man is the best Spider-Man. The PS4 game from 2018. This is what got me to really care about this character and his world. This has elements from all three franchises. It really is a love letter to the original comics, but it isn't afraid of making changes either. The design of the new suit is really something else that has never been seen before. It stands out. It's unique. Aw, oh, crap. To me, the best Spider-Man is Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, the Broadway musical from 2011. This is what got me to really care about this character and his world. This has elements from all three franchises. It really is a love letter to the original comics, but isn't afraid of making changes either. The composure of the song and dance numbers are really something that has never been seen before. It stands out. It's unique. And that's what Spider-Man should be. When Stan Lee and Steve Ditko first published Amazing Fantasy number 15, their new character stood out. He was unique. That's what every version of Spider-Man should do. It should go ever higher, excelsior, with the originality, without forgetting about the core themes. So rest in peace Stan and Steve and Jack and all those creators who weren't afraid of doing something bold to revolutionize the industry. That's what your comics will always mean to me. Hey, thanks for liking my video. If you liked it, like it. And if you didn't, tell me why you didn't like it in the comment section. I really enjoyed the making of this video, so I think I'm going to do more comic related things in the future. If that sounds good to you, subscribe so you won't miss a thing. To those already subscribed, tell me what you think of these longer videos. I, like I said, I really enjoyed making it, but it might affect my upload schedule. The script, f the script for this was nearly 20 pages long. To put that in a scale, my previous video, the Matt that one, had a script that was six pages long. I don't want to split this into two parts, and but I that might end up being a mistake. I, I guess we'll just see who gets to this part of the video. Any, also, uh, towards the end. Uh, I caught a bit of a cold, and so, sorry for my voice, but uh, yeah, thanks for watching the video, uh, see you next time.